Music can help stabilize children and help them retain enough energy so they can grow. Rhythm is a capacity that we have from a very early age. <laughs> Some researchers think that it's something that has a survival value. Listening to or making music together releases endogenous opioids in the brain. Here at Zurich University Hospital, Dr. Tanya Karin and music therapist Friederike Hasselbeck take care of premature babies at the neonatal intensive care unit. The infants were born up to three months too early and their condition has yet to stabilize. Thanks to significant medical advancements in recent years, an increasing number of preterm babies are able to survive. But we're seeing that their neurological development is still impaired. So we're looking for ways of supporting the brain, music therapy being chief among them. The two researchers use infrared sensors that look through the baby's skin and skull. The technology enables them to measure the oxygen saturation in the brain in real time, before, during, and after the music therapy. Preterm infants tend to have unstable circulation and lungs that are not fully formed. This frequently leads to reduced oxygen levels in the brain, which can in turn have grave consequences. We want to see whether it leads to better or more stable blood circulation. And what exactly happens when someone sings for the children? In this case, it's me, but it could also be the mother. The singing is beneficial for the brain's blood flow and ultimately the brain's development. While in the womb, fetuses hear their mother's heartbeat and voice and even their blood flow sounds that provide a source of reassurance and security. Uh, would uh, now be a good time for music therapy? Yeah? Oh, great. Joanna Hansen's daughter has been in the intensive care unit since she was born 15 weeks early. Being permanently exposed to external sounds and other stimuli here translate to stress for little Mia. But she's been making good progress thanks also to the music therapy. This instrument, called a monochord, has been tuned to the same pitch as the beeps of the monitoring equipment. The idea is to create a harmonious auditory atmosphere that Mia can relax in, which can be tracked via her pulse and breathing rates. This monochord was chosen and then custom built because of its deep vibrations. And just like the blood flow heard in the womb, the sound comes in waves. With the music and this vibration, it's kind of, I could close my eyes and even with the stress that I had and just calm down and let her calm down because she could hear my heartbeat going slower and, and she could breathe better. So I think it really benefits for both, both of us. Friederike Hasselbeck and her team monitored activity in the brains of 40 premature babies with the help of Magnetic Resonance Imaging, or MRIs. 
Half of the children were given music therapy twice a week. The other half, none. Interestingly, in some cases we saw anatomical changes after just 10 therapy sessions. The brains of those children who'd had music therapy saw significantly better development than those in the control group. And this was in areas that are important for language and movement, but also for academic performance and socio-emotional behavior. This kindergarten is one of a kind in the German capital, Berlin. Once a week, the children are treated to a concert by professional musicians. Today's special guest is Elena Bashkirova, world-renowned pianist and the wife of conductor Danja Barenboim, the initiator of the music-based kindergarten. His idea wasn't music education, but rather education through music and open to all children. And consequently, the kindergarten has become quite the diverse place. Music connects the soul. It doesn't need language. It's a universal medium that makes people happy. And just coming here makes me happy. I'd love to be a child in this kindergarten. Even for the youngest ones, every day here begins with music. Various studies have shown that music, and above all rhythm, are beneficial to language development. Parents of the children enrolled here have roots from over 20 different nationalities. Singing and making music help the little ones communicate with each other and give structure to the day's activities at the music kindergarten. We sing when we go out or wash our hands. The kids sing before they learn to speak. A classic example are kids who speak no German when they come to kindergarten. In the first week, they just stand and watch. In the second, they start copying the sounds. And in the third, they're singing all the songs. We see time and again how they learn language via music. Here at the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences in Leipzig, Daniela Zamla is looking at how our brains process language and music. She's discovered a range of common factors with a key role played by the melody of a language, called the prosody. The first thing children listen to once they're born is the rhythm and melody of their native language. They use very specific features, such as melodic line or pauses, to determine where a word begins and ends. If we now assume that it's crucial to learn the rhythm of language and that music also contains certain rhythms, it suggests that children who undergo musical therapy will have a better perception of rhythm, not only musically, but also with language. Translating music, rhythm and sounds into movement both trains our senses and enhances our motor skills. That helps children to develop their cognitive skills, improving their learning, thinking and memory, and their general perception. Musik machen verändert das Gehirn. Besonders wenn man sehr früh making music affects the brain, especially if you start early on before the age of 7 at kindergarten age. Active music making has been shown to strengthen the brain's auditory and motor centers. So the gray matter in the auditory centers becomes denser, while the white matter connecting the two halves of the brain, the neural highways, grows stronger. 
the neuropsychologist's studies also examine the minds of professional musicians. She's devised a special miniature piano that enables her to monitor which regions of the brain are active when her subjects make music. Theo, geht's dir gut? You okay, Theo? Yeah. In a moment, you'll see a pair of hands on the monitor, and we want you to copy what they're playing on the piano, okay? Good, here we go. We usually asked our musicians in the MRI scanner to play short melodies that had a regular structure, but not every time. Sometimes we'd surprise them with a chord that didn't fit. And you can see in the picture he's getting slower and less fluid because the grammatical rules in his brain are telling him to play something different. That's due to these grammatical patterns being anchored in the musician's brain. They dictate to his fingers how to move. Daniela Zamler suspects that this musical grammar is processed in the brain exactly like languages. These auditory centers are active, even when the musician plays piano without hearing anything. And these motor centers are active, even when he's only listening without playing. We see a strong coupling between these two regions. And up here, the grammatical center is active, regardless of whether the musician is hearing or playing something. Bei unserem Versuch ist herausgekommen, dass Musiker Our test showed that musicians follow the grammatical rules of music and activate the same grammatical centers in the brain as when hearing language and using grammatical rules. The urge to move to music is a phenomenon that's been studied by Peter Wust, a Danish jazz musician and brain researcher who's been studying the impact of rhythm and music on our motor skills. The human brain is specifically good at predicting the future. So when, for instance, we move to a beat, one, two, three, four, one, two, then the brain is actually uh, giving us a model for predicting the next beats. What rhythm does is that it tries to make something that is not quite as predictable. Something like do do k do do k do do k do do k. It'll introduce all these small breaks which we call syncopations. And that is what makes us our brains interested in this because it can't predict it completely. These beats in between are actually making prediction error in the brain. The body tries to correct that. Well, here's the beat. Dum, dum, ah, it comes a little bit too early, so you try to dum, 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 dum. So that's basically why we move to music. One well-known example is Happy by Pharrell Williams, an extremely catchy song that plays well with our expectations. It uses rhythmical ideas called syncopations, which occur between the beats. The reason why we like to dance to this music is that it has these syncopations in the melody. Cause I'm happy, clap along if you feel like a room without a roof. If a rhythm is really simple like a metronome, doof, 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 we do not want to move to it. If it's too complex, doof, doof, kick, 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 doof, 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 kick, that we cannot find the structure of the music and we are not interested in it either. But right in the middle, there's sort of a sweet spot. Most people really enjoy moving to music and probably this has something to do with the neurotransmitter dopamine. Because we know that dopamine is both a, a neurotransmitter 
that makes us a little bit high, gives us a little bit of this high, but also helps us moving. Neuroscientist Tom Fritz has invented a device called the Jimin, combining jamming with gym. It turns the user's movements into music. With cutting-edge technology, it's a workout instrument that can be played like a musical instrument. After just six to ten minutes, you get an elevated mood for a sustained period of time, similar to what athletes call a runner's high, except that they run for half an hour after six months of training. And here, people can enjoy this runner's high after just 10 minutes, thanks to this combination with music. Studies with rehab patients from various areas of medical treatment have shown the ability of Jimin to increase endurance and pain tolerance. What researchers now also want to find out is whether it can also boost performance among professional athletes. What we're ultimately measuring is the duration from liftoff to landing. That also reflects the jump height. And this actually enables us to examine physical performance. Test subject Nadine Mala has to jump as high as she can from a standing start five times, before and after training with musical feedback. Sports scientist Moritz Wehmeyer sets up the gym and devices. This is an activity sensor, which allows us to measure the speed of a movement. And this is a traction sensor. So when we pull on this resistance band, it tells us how strong the traction is, so we can influence the music. Off you go. No, first, just pulling. That combination of physical exertion and making music activates the reward system in our brain. With people suffering from addictions, Jimin can cause a feeling of euphoria, which helps to reduce their cravings. Patients with chronic pain become less anxious about painful movements, and the pain itself. Researchers suspect there's a connection to an increased release of endorphins, happiness hormones that act like the body's own pain inhibitors and increase our motivation. I'm already pretty knackered, but I want to carry on trying out the music, the sounds and the melodies. In both sports and recovery, the aim is to train our individual capacity. In sports, it's obviously about athletes wanting to go faster, higher, further. And it's basically the same with patients. Stroke patients will quickly reach their limit with unilateral weight training. And the point is pushing things that extra bit further. So? If you look at the first five and the last five jumps, these are longer. I was pretty skeptical. It's always very difficult to enhance performance, especially with only such brief measures. But what we've seen after just one test person is certainly promising. What we're seeing is an astonishingly rapid improvement in both physiological and cognitive terms. And if we do that on a daily basis during convalescence, it means patients being able to repeatedly push up their maximum individual performance. We think this will become a very meaningful concept for rehabilitation in the future.
music can change the neural activity in the areas of the brain that shape our emotions. Stefan Kirsch is looking into how that can help treat illnesses. Negative emotions and moods block our powers of self-healing. But what we now know is that music can unleash hormonal fireworks in the brain. And these changes to the brain's neurotransmitters can have a positive effect on both our mood and our health. Music indirectly releases hormones such as serotonin, oxytocin, and dopamine. They can influence the vegetative nervous system, which, largely without conscious action, regulates the body's vital processes, from our breathing and heartbeat to blood pressure and metabolism. Stefan Kirsch has conducted countless studies in which participants had a range of music played for them, from sad to upbeat or exciting. Then the researcher measured their respective emotional response. We have very strong evidence of music's ability to change particular emotions in certain structures of the brain, so we're able to conclude which signals or neurotransmitters in the brain can be changed via music. According to Kirsch, there are four systems in the brain that regulate our emotions. In the cerebrum, music activates our subconscious and the pleasure center, the source of feelings, both pleasure and pain. In the brainstem, the activating system controls vital functions and organs. Music can have a relaxing, stress-inducing impact to these systems, which all influence each other. They then activate neurotransmitters, in the process triggering feelings of happiness in a similar style to sex, recreational drugs, or food. Music can, as such, have an energizing or calming effect. It can make us scared or boost our confidence. Music travels from the inner ear via the auditory nerve to the activating system in the brainstem. A network of neurons here regulates our sleep-wake rhythm. Deactivation of this courage center, as Stefan Kirsch calls it, leads us to feeling everything from calm and relaxed to exhausted or sick. Activating it makes us feel fit, refreshed, or confident. If we play music that's positive or happy sounding and encouraging, it can help us to break through our negative thought spirals. We can use music to regulate our emotions and experience more positive feelings or good vibrations, so to speak. Listening to or making music together releases endogenous opioids. These are messenger substances in the brain that both reduce pain and elicit very positive emotions. And they make us feel more connected to other people. Dimitrios Karaminsas runs an outreach project called Mitmach Musik. Here, music is used to provide emotional first aid to children, many of whom have experienced the trauma of having to flee their homelands, or even the horrors of war. Not all of the scars they bear are immediately apparent. It doesn't matter what you've been through or where you're from. Those aren't questions we address. Having been refugees, our participants and their families have learned how serious and valuable life is. And I trust that they understand that they're safe here. That's very important for us. We leave everything that happened beforehand at the door, so we can focus solely on music for a couple of hours.
The children get the chance to try out a variety of instruments and to find their own voice. Creating something beautiful by making music, for example, boosts people's self-esteem. The Mitmach Musik project has 11 centers in Berlin and nearby Potsdam, helping young people to grow into their new society with greater confidence. Soraya Maradi has been playing the clarinet with the orchestra for two years now. It's just nice not having to play on your own. Sure, that's something you have to do too, but it's so much nicer with the group. It sounds nicer and you feel nicer and not so alone. I'll clap six times and then we'll hold that note for six beats, okay? Playing with people also means breathing together moving to the beat in the same rhythm, and working together. Getting the strings to play in tune is no easy task for beginners. Violinist Luisa Liechtenstein already has some practice under her belt. You get to know each other through music, without needing to talk. It helps you become part of the group and be recognized as a member. The orchestra's conductor, Bridget Keneary, herself discovered the integrative power of music in her childhood. I had a big move when I was 10, and it was really tough. That's when I started playing the viola, which was where I met all my friends. It gave me a kind of new home. And now, wherever I go in the world, when I hear an orchestra tuning, it feels like I'm back home. And I want to pass on that feeling. A lot of studies have shown that after making music with others, people behave more peacefully, more socially, more altruistically, and are more group-orientated. And obviously that's very relevant in evolutionary terms. Cooperating with others strengthens the social unit, and biologically speaking, that improves the chances of survival for individual members of that unit. Karin Ziem suffers from Parkinson's, a currently incurable disease that affects the central nervous system. Peter Wust composes custom-made rhythms to counter the condition's progression. The music helps to alleviate symptoms such as tremors, muscle stiffness, an unstable posture, and slower movement. Welcome. Studies show that just using a metronome can make a clear improvement in the speed and the number of steps the patient can manage. I'll now play you some different rhythms. Okay. Let's try this one, for example. And when you hear this one, that's definitely better. Could you try to move with the rhythm, just naturally, as if you were going for a walk? See if you can keep that rhythm while walking. Great. It's difficult. When we hear rhythms, there's a translation between our auditory system and the brain's motor sections. And that linkage between the two systems isn't so easy for Parkinson's patients as it is for you and me. So a large part of our research is about determining how we can compose rhythms to be of maximum benefit to Parkinson's patients. Great, and now this rhythm. The 
hvis jeg går i et tempo, der ligesom ikke passer mig, så... When I walk at a speed that doesn't suit me, I lose my rhythm. It then feels as if the right-hand side of my body, the one more affected by Parkinson's, is kind of stuck. But when I follow a rhythm that works, it feels as if I don't even have Parkinson's. So it's the right rhythm that gets my body to move in a way that's good for me. Twice a week, this building hosts Berlin's Tango Parkinson's Group. Here, the dance serves as therapy, under the guidance of Augusto Salvo Gonzalez. Tango has a very slow rhythm. Tango has a very slow rhythm equivalent to walking slowly, and that feature helps to center the Parkinson's patients. Their movement suffers from a lack of coordination, and this music helps to synchronize their walking. So instead of those stuttering movements, their walking is suddenly smooth. Between the actual dancing sessions, the tango instructor has participants play games, aimed at training their coordination. Always accompanied by music, in order to support their motor skills when tackling what can be quite the challenging task. I see how the patients come I see the patients when they arrive and how they leave. And that's a huge success, which after the session manifests itself in mobility, security, and a more upright posture. And get taller and taller. Come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> now dance like that. And in addition to the therapy sessions, Anita Prieto also attends regular tango events called milongas. Dancing is really important for me. It strengthens my stamina, boosts my memory and keeps me mobile. I used to be really stiff, and then I started doing a different dance, belly dancing. And then I noticed how many muscles I have and how important movement is. Then I started doing tango, which is even nicer. And it's really addictive. Peter Materna got the tango bug two years ago. I used to be really hunched over and could barely walk, at best for 10 minutes, and then I'd have to take a break. Now, I can walk for one hour straight before taking a break, so that's a massive improvement. The new steps patients learn via tango helps them to train both their mobility and their memory, a vital factor with Parkinson's. As the disease progresses, it can, in many cases, lead to dementia. Manuel Banvart hosts weekly music therapy sessions at the dementia ward of the Royce Park Nursing Home. I try to focus on their remaining resources. If they're not yet hard of hearing, they can still be accessed via the ears. And the heart doesn't suffer from dementia either, meaning the emotional connection to music is a resource they bring with them, and one that's preserved for a very long time.
We're currently looking into whether with Alzheimer's patients, for example, stimulating the brain's happiness center can lead to new nerve cells being generated again. Stefan Kirsch and his team have been monitoring the members of a dementia group choir as part of a long-term study. They suspect that music is particularly effective when it comes to stimulating the dentate gyrus, a part of the brain that generates new nerve cells. Provisional results give us reason to be optimistic about music's potential for slowing down the neurodegenerative process. In some cases, especially in early stage development, it might even be able to reverse brain aging and make the brain a bit younger. I've got you under my skin. And other studies have shown that music, sounds and other noises help dementia sufferers to recall autobiographical memories. That's why Ursula Kurt arranges visits to her husband Gottfried to coincide with the music therapy sessions. We were members of a dance club for many years, and that's now all coming back. It's great to still be able to do that with my husband. It's nice. I believe there may be a kind of emotion memory tunnel in the brain that can be opened up by music, especially by music that moves us. Feelings and recollections of the past are linked together in parts of the motor cortex of the brain. This is stimulated by emotional music and in turn activates our memory and opens what Stefan Kirsch calls the emotion memory tunnel. I think that opening this tunnel could then lead to memories reappearing that were believed to have been lost. Under the guidance of geriatric researcher Sandra Opikofer, the nursing home staff create what are called personal music mirrors. Together with the dementia patients, they try to find important moments in their lives connected with music. The idea is to use music associated with positive memories to increase residents' willingness to take part in everyday life and therapy sessions. We mainly use it when we help the residents with personal hygiene, when they're not interested or don't understand what we're asking them to do and why. And it helps to give them a positive feeling if they're sad or restless, and to create a bond with us. Now you can get up. And here's your walker. People with dementia forget who they are. They forget their self-identity. So if we're able to use positive personal memories linked to music to give the individual a sense of their identity again, then we can interact with them on equal terms in those moments. Sandra Opikofa introduced the therapy concept at the Swiss nursing home after discovering it in Britain. She was the first person to conduct a scientific study on its effectiveness in the field. When using the music mirror on a regular basis, we saw a significant improvement in well-being. Stress levels were down, and there was a reduction in behavioural problems such as aggression and restlessness. And individuals were able to build up a relationship with their carers. What's more, since the introduction of the music mirror, staff have been able to reduce medication among the dementia patients. Music isn't a substitute for medicine, but as an effective therapy, it can deliver a perfect complement and with no side effects. And now let's go for our walk. 
Oh. Oh. Uh. 